What's good everybody, it's Robo back with another video and today I've got my 2024 NBA Draft Big Board 3.0. I'll most likely drop one final Big Board update and a final mock about a week before the draft, but this is where I stand in the class right now post NCAA withdrawal deadline. Every college prospect in this video is officially entered in the draft, and in my opinion, it's a pretty deep class. It's just not as gifted with high-end talent as usual. There are some guys I left out though that are definitely worth picking, so let's go ahead and get started with some honorable mentions. Here are all my honorable mentions. As I said, I could easily see several of these guys getting picked, especially in a class like this where we could see a ton of reaches because of a smaller talent gap. Some of these guys could end up being late first round picks for all we know, but as of right now, I just felt better about the guys in my top 60, but there really isn't much of a gap at all. Tristan Newton transferred into UConn from East Carolina and won back-to-back -back national titles there, showing off his value as a winning player. He's not the greatest shooter, but knocked on a ton of shots in his two years at UConn and shot well from the free throw line, which could show potential growth with the jumper. His main value on the floor is the scrappiness, averaging over 6 rebounds a game to go along with 15 points and 6 assists. He's the perfect glue guy for the college game and has definitely shown enough potential to be considered for this draft. Trenton Flowers decommitted from Louisville for the NBL last year and didn't get a ton of time but flashed some NBA tools in his minutes and finished with pretty solid splits. Overall as a player, he's more gifted as a driver and a cutter and has a lot of athleticism and transition. Even though his shooting numbers look good, he's not a huge threat to shoot off the dribble right now and his form and handle isn't great, but if that becomes a quality skill of his, he has a future in the league as an athletic bench wing. I didn't think staying in the draft was the best choice for Bronny James' future, but he probably has a promise or some info saying he could go a lot higher than this, specifically from the Suns or Lakers as he only done workouts for those two teams and declined all others thus far. As a player, Bronny has a lot of NBA tools, but is pretty far away from being ready to contribute in my opinion, which is why I have him ranked all the way down here in this class. It wouldn't surprise me at all to see him pan out to be a successful NBA player eventually with all the tools he has access to and his skill set. It's just going to take some time to adjust and grow his game as a whole. Antonio Reeves is one of the best pure bucket getters in this class, averaging over 20 points a night on a stacked Kentucky roster of guards, and his efficiency was unbelievable considering the volume, shooting nearly 45% from deep and over 50% from the floor. Reeves is an older prospect as he spent 5 years in college starting off at Illinois State, but at 6'5", his size and scoring ability is good enough to potentially be a strong bench scorer in the NBA, and we all know the success rate of Kentucky guards in the league. Keshad Johnson put himself on the NBA radar this season after a huge shooting improvement going from the mid-20s from deep in four years at San Diego State to nearly 40% this season at Arizona. We'll have to see if that's an actual strength of his or just a hot season, but his primary value on the floor is definitely his defense. He has a super strong frame for 6'6", and has a plus 4 wingspan to go with that, allowing him to be versatile in defending guards and forwards, so if the shooting is legit, he could definitely carve out a role in the league. Jalen Wills had a huge rise this year going from the D2 ranks to an eventual starter for Washington State, mostly due to his elite shooting on the wing, shooting 42% from deep on almost 5 attempts a game, and he has enough size and length to be a positive rebounder and defender at the next level as well. He only spent the one year in Division 1, so teams could see his immediate impact as a sign of a lot more potential to come, and I wouldn't be surprised to see his name come off the board earlier than I have him here ranked right now. Baylor's Jalen Bridges is still a guy I could see going in the early second round of this draft, as big wings with his skill set aren't super common. He shot over 40% from behind the arc this year and was a reliable defender and free throw shooter, exactly the type of winning players a lot of teams look for in the draft. He just didn't flash much potential as a high usage player, which is why I have him ranked a bit lower here. PJ Hall is a modern style 4 man with a versatile offensive game. He's got a good 3 point jumper as well as a great post game, especially with the footwork and great hands in the post even through contact. He's got a wide frame that'll help him create space and get shots off against any big in the post, even at just 6'8", but the pick and pop threat he provides can open up a lot of possibilities for an offense that takes him in this draft. Izan <laughs> Almansa has fallen down the board quite a bit this year as he just didn't seem to make the offensive leap people really wanted to see, but he's still an efficient paint scorer and strong offensive rebounder with good size, and a decent finisher in the pick and roll who looks to impact winning with low turnovers, solid defense, and high IQ, and pretty solid touch in the paint on floaters and layups. I definitely see him getting picked in this draft, it's just a matter of the fit. Melvin Ajinsa is a French born prospect playing in the LNB Pro A League, and although his shooting splits weren't very good this year, the ability's still been on display, and he's still seen as a higher potential guy with his size and skill set. He's shown a solid defensive ability and has NBA level athleticism already, and a strong enough jumper that a lot of scouts think he could be a genuine contributor in the league soon. Juan Nunez is a pure point guard prospect with some elite passing skills. He's a flashy lefty out of Spain who has really been a consistent player this year. The free throw numbers are a definite concern of his, but the defensive instincts and flashes as an elite passer and playmaker are what catches the eye of scouts. His stock is pretty all over the place, but I think he'll definitely get picked in June, potentially even in the first round.
Pella Larson is a six foot five shooting guard out of Arizona who has enough on ball ability to fit in as a combo guard the next level if needed as he's a really strong shooter with a lot of playmaking flashes as well. He did a bit of everything for Arizona this season, shooting over 50% from the floor and over 42% from three while playing fairly solid defense on the other end. He is an older prospect, but that also comes with a lot of experience in college. Jonathan Mogbo is a lengthy small ball five who came in at just six foot six at the combine, but he has freak strength, length, and athleticism that will allow him to be able to run the four in the NBA on top of that small ball five role. His range is obviously limited right now, but he's a gifted passer and creator with the ball in his hands, which helps make his role much more than just a mobile role man. He's got the upside to be a big steal in this draft in the second round. The Dons bring it back. Williams. Also, Igadaro is an inside the arc focused big man who has an incredible feel for the game as a passer, screener, and role man, and plays with a strong sense of how and when to switch on defense. He plays winning basketball at all times. He had good efficiency inside, but he's no threat from outside at all. My comp for him is Trace Jackson Davis, which I gave him my first big board. Again, he's a bit taller and a little less of an athlete in my opinion, but the IQ and playmaking is a big asset for him. You're gonna get a look. Look at this two-man play. By the numbers, you wouldn't expect AJ Johnson to be on NBA radars at all right now, but a lot of scouts really like his upside. He's lanky and super quick with a strong handle to create open looks, but just really lacked efficiency and has a lot to learn on the floor before he can be an impact guy, which isn't a shock considering his age and skipping college for a year of the NBL. He definitely needs to put on size as well, and will probably spend a year or two in the G League before any NBA looks, but he's got a lot of potential. Ulrich Chomche is a big man out of the NBA Academy in Africa, and he had the option to go to the college route, which could have been really beneficial to his game, but after he showed out while playing at the NBA Academy games, it may have been the right choice to capitalize on the draft stock and declare here. He looks to have a pretty strong jumper already, and is the youngest player in the entire draft class. With his size and athleticism, I think there's a chance he ends up a gem if he lands up in the right situation. Jamal Shedd's another guy I think some teams could consider in the early second round because he can genuinely compete for minutes right away thanks to his defensive energy. He won Defensive Player of the Year as well as the Overall Player of the Year in the Big 12 this year. He's a smaller guard, but with his athletic ability, he could mold a role as a lead guard defender on a bench unit while he grows into a more consistent shooter over time. Adem Bono was a Defensive Player of the Year in the Pac-12 this season, which says a lot about his rim protection and on-ball defensive versatility as a big man as he came in at just 6'8 at the Combine. He plays with a super high motor on the defensive end, and he contests as many shots as he can. He definitely could improve his touch on the offensive end in the coming years, though, to become a more well-rounded player. Trey Alexander could end up a gem from this class. I would still consider him a potential first-rounder despite being here at 42. He struggled from three early on in the season, which dragged his numbers down a bit, but they still finished at 34%. His bread and butter is the mid-range, and he's been such a proven guy. Creighton went to him countless times in the clutch this year, and he delivered. His defense is a great asset of his, as well as some playmaking ability, so when the shots aren't falling, he's still a guy you want on the floor. Alexander, one minute to go. Alexander, what a move. KJ Simpson's a really gifted scoring point guard out of Colorado, being in consideration for Pac-12 Player of the Year and landing on the first team this season. He put up an incredibly efficient 20 points a night, shooting almost 44% from deep on high volume, but also great shot selection, as he's still a patient scorer, which is a huge plus. He's only six foot, but guys who score as well as he does and are smart with the ball in their hands stand a good chance to stick in the NBA. Justin Edwards was someone I thought would benefit from staying in school another year, but ultimately he decided to enter the draft instead, and he's got more than enough ability and potential to get picked. He was ranked as a top five prospect in this year's draft at the beginning of the year, but had a really rough start to the year and couldn't get involved much at Kentucky. He did have a couple breakout nights though, and could make a team really happy over the next few years if he ends up panning out as a scoring wing. Shepard drives a lot of attention towards him. Edwards, six man of the year. Cross court pass. Edwards a three. Minnesota guard Cam Christie comes in at 39. Cam is the younger brother of the Lakers' Max Christie, and it's kind of all over boards, but decided to stay in the draft rather than giving it one more year. The same choice his brother made. I think staying would have helped his game out quite a bit, but someone's going to bite on his potential as a scorer because he's got a lot of tools and great size for a two guard in the league, especially still only being 18 years old right now, making him really attractive to a lot of front offices. AJ Mitchell's kind of been in the late first, early second range for a big chunk of the season, and I think that's where he should end up. He's a point guard with decent size at 6'3", while being an excellent shooter off the dribble. He's got some length and found a lot of success as a driver as well this season, finishing on the first team in the Big West, following up that Player of the Year campaign in the same conference last season. Minutes without a point. AJ Mitchell spins around Allen Ikins. 
Goaltending. Goaltending. Serbian wing Nikola Jurisic is a guy who could easily go high in this draft after a huge late season surge, but the early efficiency is definitely a slight cause for concern. He's got a lot of tools offensively and has really come on late boosting those numbers. He showed a lot of potential at the combine playing really well in the 5v5 games. Personally, I still believe he's a second round prospect, but I could see a team really liking what he's shown lately and considering him with their first round selection. Harrison Ingram blew up this year after a super strong season on both ends, especially in a shooting sense as he knocked down threes at a high level, especially late in the year throughout the tournament. He's another high IQ defensive minded forward who's better off as a three in the NBA, but played just mainly the four for UNC. But at just six foot five, the shooting coming along is huge for his future. As paired that with the defensive instincts and high motor, he'll be hard to keep off the floor in the NBA. Dylan Jones is an absolute dog coming out of Weber State. He's got a real nice game. I think it catch the eye of a lot of playoff caliber teams. He's a stocky on-ball wing with a lot of strength to his frame and loves to score at the rim even though he doesn't show a ton of vertical athleticism in game. He just got a great touch and strong feel for the mid-range and his work ethic stands out as he ended the game this year with 30 points, 23 rebounds, and 9 assists, which can tell you exactly the type of player that he is. MVP candidate Booker. Crossing over with the money on the table. Bobby Clintman's another overseas prospect, this time from Sweden, who has been all over boards for years now during his time at Wake Forest and now in the NBL. He's still raw overall, but he's got a lot of length as a versatile forward. He's shown some strong slashing ability at times and still can grow into his frame a bit more. He's got a solid feel for his jumper, which is pretty fluid, but he just needs to be more consistent so he can become a more reliable player on the offensive end. I'm a big fan of what Tyler Kolek brings to the table as a lead initiator for an offense. He's an incredibly tough player with a high motor and gets under guys' skin constantly while playing at a high level on the floor. He's got a really well-rounded offensive game with a strong jumper and great touch around the rim, but he thrives most as a playmaker and play initiator as you see with the assist numbers. I could see him fitting in well off the bench for just about anyone in the league right away. Two-man game with Kolek. A little bit of contact. Ryan Dunn's a guy a lot of people, including myself, were much higher on early in the year, but the poor showings on the offensive end and ability to just disappear offensively have really caused his stock to drop. Nonetheless, he's an elite athlete who thrives on defense. You could argue he's the best overall defender in this draft. He's got an incredible ability to shut down possessions as a help defender and block shots all over the floor with several games this year of five plus blocks. If he's able to develop a consistent shot from the corner, he can pave his way into bigger minutes at the next level. I've dropped Terrence Shannon Jr. down here to 31 in this class, but I still really like his game. The off the court stuff is still looming though, so I understand why some would prefer to wait it out as his status in the draft depends on that situation figuring itself out. But on the court, Terrence is a really strong ISO and transition scorer, just dominating towards the end of the year, dropping 30 plus seemingly every game in the Big Ten and NCAA tournaments. He's a gifted attacker, so when the jumper is falling as well as it can at times, there's not much teams could do to limit him. He is a bit older, but I think his experience and athletic ability will help him get drafted around this range, pending the off the court stuff. Pacom Dadier is another high potential French wing prospect who can really play as a 2 or 3, but the listed size says more as a 3 in the NBA at 6 foot 8. We'll see what the official measurements are next week, but regardless, he's going to continue to grow into his frame and become an even better athlete, but already looks to fit that 3 and D mold every team looks for. And he's got a pretty strong feel for the game already while still being only 18 years old, which is a great sign for his development. Baylor Shireman has been really underrated in terms of draft stock for a while throughout the year, but started getting more respect as the season went on. And after a huge combine, I shot him into the first round conversation. He's a do-it-all wing out of Creighton where he averaged 19, 9, and 4 on good shooting splits. He brings elite shooting to the floor as well as the size and versatility to fit in as a wing you want to give a bunch of minutes to off the bench in the future. Shireman, step back jumper. Kevin McCullough is another all-around college wing who has a chance to be a really solid player at the next level. He brings a lot of experience to the table with a strong IQ on both ends of the floor and he plays hard pretty much at all times and blossomed into a number one scoring option at Kansas before he went down with an injury at the end of the season. But when healthy, he was letting it up on the stat sheet, scoring around 20 a game while being a solid connective wing. The jump shot's still coming along, but he found some success with it this season and has enough game off the dribble to score in other ways when that jumper's not falling. McCullough! Outside. Another K-State turnover. And you and I were talking at, at halftime. Keyshawn George was a big freshman riser this year as when the season went on, he got more and more involved in Miami's offense. He's a lanky guard with a solid handle and a lot of ability off the dribble. He shot over 40% from deep this season, which is a great sign with his size at the guard spot coming in at 6'7", 209. 
Keyshawn can bring it defensively as well, using his length to defend in space. And picked up a steal per game in just 23 minutes a night. He's a guy I could see ending up a lottery pick based on potential, as a team could see him as a home run type of player in a weaker class. To bother his shot. Not those 33 so much so that they put size on him this game. George will fire nine. Deron Holmes is one of my favorites in this class. He's a big time athlete at the four and five spots who plays mainly in the middle of the floor. He's got a lot of power and strength as a roll man, but also a really nice jumper to complement it, coming around at 39% from deep. He's a strong paint defender with both blocking and affecting shots at the rim, and had a huge season at Dayton, winning A10 Defensive Player of the Year, as well as the overall player of the year in the conference. And he took his squad into the second round of the NCAA tournament this season. There's not a lot on the floor he can't do, and I wouldn't be shocked if his name was called in the first round in June. Big step fight. Johnny Furphy is an Australian-born wing prospect with great size at 6'8 and exploded onto the draft scene after a strong freshman year at Kansas. He's an elite shooter from any spot on the floor and can pull up off the dribble but thrives most off the ball. He's shown solid defensive instincts and uses his length well, but he could obviously grow into that area as he gets more athletic and eventually could improve his ability as a ball handler to round out his offensive game. He's only 19 right now, so a lot of time for growth, but his jumper and IQ on the floor are what makes people project him to be a high-quality spot-up wing in the NBA. Furphy, he's an excellent defender. He got burned there. Big. Next is Zach Eady, who I've been a bit lower on than some others, but Eady's a giant of a big at a legit 7'4", 300 pounds. He's developed enough mobility to fit the NBA game, unlike some other big-time college players in the past. I still like the bigger Ivica Zubac comparison, but I've seen Jonas Valanciunas thrown around lately. Eady's touch in the paint and feel for where he's at with the ball when it's on full display when up against Donovan Klingon, who is probably the toughest matchup in all of college basketball. I think he proved this year he's more than just tall, winning National Player of the Year again. And if he keeps expanding his range, whoever takes him in the first round will be extremely happy. Jalen Tyson had a huge season this year at Cal, scoring nearly 20 points a game as the go-to guy in the squad. He's a bigger guard coming in at 6'6 six six and has more than enough ability on ball to be a solid two guard at the next level or even a three. The jumper is there and he's a big time athlete as he showed all year. And he showed some quality playmaking ability this season becoming a more versatile player which could really help him become a first round pick in June and maybe even sneak near the lottery range. Thank you, David. Uh, you don't look a day over 30. Yes. And Bali Dante had it ripped by Tyson. Baylor's Eves Misi is an absolute monster in the paint and had a really big freshman season compared to his expectations. Misi draws a lot of Clint Capella comps and for good reason he's been such a reliable screener and roll man this year and has the athleticism and catch radius to go catch lobs off the pick and roll. He works super hard on the floor and has incredible athleticism and strength. He doesn't have a jumper to this point and really lacks touch in the post, but if he works on developing that touch and expanding his post game and his defensive IQ, he has a chance to be a strong starting caliber defensive anchor in the NBA. Ray J. Dennis, really valuable. Bob Carrington shot himself in a draft consideration immediately as the season started kicking things off with a triple-double early on, and then slowed up a bit efficiency-wise throughout the middle of the year, but came on again late. He originally said he would return to school, but changed his mind and entered the draft, which I think was a smart choice. He's got a ton of ability as a scorer off the dribble, and has a pretty high ceiling as a scorer because of his length and offensive bag combo. And he measured in a legit 6'4 at the combine, which is great for his versatility as a combo guard. The three. Yes. Tristan Da Silva has gotten a pretty big stock boost towards the end of the year as he really came on late on both ends of the floor. At 6'9", he's an experienced forward with a really smooth offensive game, mainly with his footwork and on-ball ability, but he also has a super strong spot-up option as he shot around 40% from deep this year. He's flirted with the draft process in the past and has gotten some interest from scouts, but smartly opted to continue improving his game in college and has done a lot for him. I think in this class there's a chance he's taken near the lottery and he'll bring good efficiency in winning basketball to whoever takes him. And they do go with some pressure. But there's no way how can guard the silver off the drip. Look at the silver! It's congested in there. The silver three. Kalel Ware is a former top prospect who didn't perform at Oregon, but really found himself at Indiana this year. He's a freak athlete for a seven-footer, paired with a pretty strong jumper and more than enough length to be a strong shot blocker and lob threat at the next level. He's improved his footwork and the paint on both ends of the floor, and has some on-ball skill as well as to play in the perimeter at times. The biggest question surrounding Ware not being a contested lottery prospect is the motor as well as his physicality. He's been a pretty ineffective as a screener throughout his college career, but I could easily see him being a lottery pick this year regardless. Yeah. On Sunday, there's some kind of protective padding. Greatness from Xavier Johnson at times, but he hasn't been consistent. He's going to have to be good tonight. Tyler Smith is another one of my favorites dating back to his overtime elite days. I mocked him in the first round last summer in my way too early mock draft. And since then, he just blossomed into an elite offensive four for the G League Ignite, which has his stock sitting firmly in the first round right now. He's got a strong frame that can get pretty crafty as a lefty stretch four, 
complementing his athleticism with the ability to put the ball on the floor to attack closeouts. Defensively, he can block shots with some athleticism, but he isn't close to being a strong defender at the next level, so he fits best as a stretch four in the NBA next to an anchor at the five. Here's Smith calling for it. Two seconds, rising up. <laughs> Tyler Smith has 22. Kyle Filipowski is somewhat all over board still, as some love him and some don't, but as a player, he's a 6'11 stretch big who has really strong floor mobility for his size, as well as being an above average ball handler for the position. He showed some more playmaking ability this season and improved on the defensive end a little bit, which is easily his biggest question mark where he considered entering last season's draft. He seemed more capable of defending the rim, but still struggled to match up against guys with bigger frames or dominant post games. That'll still be a weakness of his, but regardless as a whole, I still think he did improve a bit in that area, and offensively, he can fit the league pretty well. The jumper. Out of the play a little bit. Filipowski against Francis uses the body. Tijan Salon is a French-born wing prospect with a lot of athleticism and a decent jumper. Although he's only 212 pounds at 6'9", he's got broad shoulders, which gives him a lot of room to grow strength-wise to help him become a more efficient attacker and defender. He's already learned to use his athleticism and burst when driving to the rim, and on the defensive end, he uses that to his advantage as well. But he's a pretty raw prospect still, as he's gone hot and cold throughout the year and gotten back on track lately to really climb back up draft boards, which is why I've moved him back up near the lottery range. If he's taken to the right fit, that untapped potential could be a crack open and he could turn into a future 3 and D star in the NBA. Jared McCain absolutely blew up this season, butting into a potential lottery pick thanks to his extremely efficient season as a shooter in just about every situation this year. But despite the elite jump shot, he can also put the ball on the floor to attack hard closeouts and was super reliable from the free throw line, which is always a telling sign for a shooter's consistency. He's not a lead ball handler, which hurts a bit because of his size, but he can run an offense from time to time. And he's a solid passer and high IQ player. Defensively, he's more of a team guy with his instincts and activity, but the shooting ability is so strong, it should lead to quality minutes at the NBA level, even as a rookie. Young in there for Duke. Deep one, heat check. Oh, yeah. Good job twice. Leak out here. McCain, that's a deep one. We will see. Devin Carter's coming off an incredible junior season that brought him a Big East Player of the Year award, and he became one of the best defenders in the country. He's super active with a freak level motor and has an absurd amount of confidence on both ends of the floor. At the combine, he delivered one of the best athletic days we've seen from a guy his size, just six foot two. He's got a ton of bounce and quickness, and the range on his jumper was a huge asset for him this year as he hit shots from the logo on several occasions. His shot selection could be a bit of a concern, but that was pretty much just his role at Providence. I think whoever ends up grabbing Carter in the first this year is going to get an absolute dog. Back his way in, drops down, jumps in. Takes a three. Jacoby Walter had a hot start to his freshman season at Baylor, looking like arguably the best freshman in the class, but his shot went pretty cold and didn't recover until towards the end of the year. But he showed he can score at a high level from anywhere on the floor and did so on a really good Baylor team. Jacoby should be a strong shooter at the next level with enough on-ball ability to take advantage of lesser defenders and would fit really well as a scoring guard next to a playmaker. The ball handling is there, so if he keeps growing his efficiency, he could become a really strong scoring threat similar to a guy like Chris Middleton. But for now, with the range and defense, I think his role could be similar to a guy like KCP. But he can see the floor right away in my opinion. Cody Williams saw a huge rise early on in the year with a strong start to the season on both ends of the floor as well as the success of his brother in the NBA. And although he slipped a bit as the shooting volume wasn't very high, he's got great tools and size on the wing and finishes at the rim really well and gets there often off the dribble. He's got a strong handle for his wing and can be a solid passer as well, pretty similar to his brother in terms of his feel for the game. In the half court, he really just needs to improve his jumper and get more confident in taking shots. If he improves as a creator and a scorer over the next few years, his potential could be through the roof. late in the shot clock. Cody Williams just muscling. O'Brien and a three. Isaiah Collier is the former number one player in this class and was originally slated to be a top five pick in this draft before some poor efficiency and an injury. But when he came back late in the year, he had some really strong outings. The poor start was probably due to the adjustment period freshman guards usually have with the college game. And Collier has shown he can be an incredible creator in isolation in the pick and roll. He's got a nasty first step to help him get downhill and draws fouls at a high rate. And he's a very gifted lead playmaker. I think Collier should still be considered a potential top 10 pick in this draft. He just needs the right fit to excel in. You can't just, whoa, wow. Oh, Collier's got two off the steal. Check out Collier. Collier driving into traffic. Banks it in. Dalton Connect is the biggest riser of the season going from a Juco to Northern Colorado to the SEC Player of the Year at Tennessee. Connect averaged 22 a night for the Vols and brings elite shooting to the floor and scores from all three levels and genuinely has NBA level athleticism both in the half court and in transition to really be a dynamic offensive player. His on-ball ability is a lot higher than he gets credit for as he can operate in the pick and roll as both a ball handler and a scorer. 
age and defense are the main concerns with connect but i really like his upside as a potential second or third scoring option at some point in his career connect that's a deep three it's but jones turns it over and now numbers the other way connect is going to do it himself Donovan Klingon had an early season injury, which stalled the stock quite a bit, but he absolutely dominated down the stretch of the season and won his second national championship at UConn, holding his own against the nation's best in Zach Eady. Klingon's a 7'2 center who brings a ton of defensive potential as an anchor with strong rim protection and quick feet. Offensively, he isn't a threat from the perimeter, but I know he's been working on it. His main game is on the defensive end, just being an absolute force in the paint. Teams completely refused to attack the rim when he was in the game all year, and that could continue into the NBA, similar to a Walker Kessler, so I'd be surprised if Klingon made it outside the top 10 in this class. Steph Castle quickly became one of my favorite players to watch this season because of his unselfishness and elite work ethic on the floor. He had a slow start to the season with a jumper, but improved over the course of the year, although he still wasn't a huge threat to shoot. But he just plays with such a strong motor and energy. He's a big reason why UConn won the title again this season. His defense is the selling point for his game, as he can take a guard completely out of the game. And as he keeps growing as an offensive player, he can be a really high potential lead guard talent who can make plays downhill as both a scorer and a playmaker, and hopefully continues to improve as a shooter to become a serious weapon on the both ends of the floor and be well worth a top 10 pick. And he didn't get it up on the board. Nikola Topic is one of the top guards in this draft class, and some have him as high as a top three prospect. He has some athleticism questions, but he's a typical Euro guard with great size and has an excellent pick and roll ball handler. He can push the ball downhill with ease and get to the rim where he's really crafty as a finisher. He's a capable defender as well, so the big question is going to be how successful of a shooter he is. He shot just 28% from deep this season, so early on in the NBA, the range could be a problem. But he's got a decent form and a lot to suggest growth in that area. But after another recent injury, I think those concerns are another reason why he could fall into the mid-lottery. Reed Shepard's one of the best guards in this class and had a huge freshman season at Kentucky on both ends of the floor, having record-breaking efficiency shooting 52% from three on pretty high volume, as well as being a super active on the defensive end, grabbing 2.5 steals a night and blocking almost a shot per game. Reed's considered a combo guard, but with his size, court vision, and IQ, I think can be a real lead ball handler, and the motor is something you really want out of a young guard off the bench. The only limitation that comes with Reed is the size, but he put up a 42 inch vertical to combine to help mitigate that. I just don't know if he has the elite quickness to get downhill with consistency yet, but there's no doubt that'll be a focal point for his future. Screen. Shepard again. Yes! The same Kentucky team a year ago. Shepard again. Matas Buzelis is my number five prospect in this draft right now. I've really liked his game for a while, and I'm a bit higher on both him and Ron Holland than others. And with the recent struggles of a lot of Ignite players in the league, there could be a good reason for that. But I think a class like this, both Ron and Matas are well worth high draft picks. Matas's game is really strong. A lot of people put the Franz Wagner label on it, which is really high praise as Franz is a great player. But I think he's got some more athleticism and not as much playmaking and defensive upside as Franz. For a 6'9 wing, Matas has enough skill to be considered a 2, 3, or a 4 at the next level. His shooting splits weren't great this year, but were solid in the past, and I'm a believer in his offensive game and jumper form, and he should have a much easier time playing more off-ball in the NBA. Other guys to step up and develop. Here's oh. Buzelis! It's about the feel of the shoe, you know, just sometimes, oh! <laughs> Rob Dillingham's my top college prospect still, and was easily the most fun player to watch in college basketball this season for me. He absolutely lit it up this season off the bench, winning SEC Sixth Man of the Year, and formed the best freshman duo in the country with Reed Shepard. He's an incredibly skilled scorer and shifty ball handler who can pull up from anywhere in the half court at any time. He plays at a high pace but is extremely quick as a handler and can go coast to coast in a blur. He's often compared to Emmanuel Quickly and Tyrese Maxey for obvious reasons. And I think that can be pretty spot on. There's just some size questions at just six foot one, but he's super crafty at the rim. He really just needs to get more size and get stronger for the NBA. I think Cal sees the same thing. Let, let Dillingham have a couple of minutes here. Oh, alley yeah. to the year. Doesn't have to be in a hurry. Gets downhill, hangs. Oh, what a finish! I move Zachary Risache back up towards the top of the board after a big late season surge, bouncing back from a rough patch of 10 games or so. When he's got it going, he can be a really good 3 and D prospect, and I've seen a lot of hype on him being a top 2 pick in this draft. Risache is another French prospect who really proved himself early on in the season as one of the best in the class. He's got a strong jumper from deep and should be able to thrive as a shooter, especially off the catch. And with his size, he has some high defensive upside. If the Hawks are willing to take Risache in the top 2 of this class, it wouldn't be a shock to me at all with his potential being what it is at a very sought after role in the NBA. Here he goes again. Rizache, they will come to Rizache, brother. Swings it across. Drive through the paint up and down. As I alluded to while talking about Matas, I'm still really high on Ron Holland, who is still my number two in the classes of today, even after this late surge by Rizache. 
Again, poor efficiency and turnovers cause Ron to fall the mid lottery in a lot of places. But as I mentioned, the Ignite program has not been kind to a lot of guys. The shot selection and simplicity isn't there for the young guys. Going in the year, we knew Ron was a raw prospect too. He's still only 18 years old today, so the elite slashing ability is really impressive to me. 21 points a game against grown men without knocking down many shots from deep is really hard to do, and he got there with the nasty first step and transition game turning defense into offense. As he gets older, I think the jumper could start to click, making him a potential star player. Simon Holland, his pass is stolen by Hinton. Hinton goes up. And Alex Saar is still my number one prospect in the class for a bunch of reasons. Statistically, he may not look like a number one pick, but he played just 17 minutes a night and showed more than enough defensive ability to be considered the best prospect in this class. He's got enough mobility to guard the perimeter at a high level. I would agree that he's a pretty similar player to a Jaron Jackson Jr. or Jonathan Isaac on the defensive end as prospects, and a jumper should continue to improve from an already solid spot being around 30% on somewhat low volume due to his role in low minutes this year. When you look at his numbers from a per 36 perspective, the points and block numbers start to look real convincing that he could be a star in the NBA. Continuing to be aggressive. Sar. That's it for my 2024 NBA Draft Big Board 3.0. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments and who you want to see your team pick this year. Thanks for watching as always. Feel free to like and subscribe if you haven't already. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.